I'm Dr. Tanya Harrison, and I am the Manager of Science Programs for the Federal Arm of Planet Labs. Today we're going to be talking about unlocking insights from Earth observation imagery using machine learning. Now, for those folks that might not be familiar with Planet, Planet's mission is to image the whole world every day to make change visible, accessible, and actionable. But just to give you an idea of how much imagery this is that we collect on a daily basis, this is what one day of our planet looks like. So you'll notice we only have coverage over the land masses. We image the entire land mass of the Earth on a near daily basis out to about 15 kilometers away from the coasts. And we accomplish this through our Dove satellites, which take advantage of the rotation of the Earth. There are over 150 of them orbiting in a sun synchronous orbit, basically acting as a giant line scanner, taking pictures in an always on sort of mode as they orbit around the Earth. And then we build up coverage strip by strip by strip as the Earth rotates beneath the Doves. We also have 21 Skysat satellites that take 50 centimeter resolution images. This animation is actually slightly out of date because we just lowered the elevation or lowered the orbit altitude of all of those satellites to get a higher resolution. So we can get sort of these context images of the planet and then zoom in with the SkySat images. Between these two constellations, we downlink 15 terabytes of data every single day, which covers 350 million square kilometers. This is a lot of data. And to be able to handle it and actually know what this data is telling us, we need artificial intelligence. We need machine learning. There's just too much data here for any one person to go through, for any army of graduate students to go through. And this is where the academic community has really stepped up. When you have this kind of coverage, you can watch changes over really long time scales because our imagery goes back to about 2016. This is an example of capturing deforestation in the Amazon during specific seasons. So you'll notice that there's a jump in the dates of the imagery each year. That's not gaps in the data, that's just gaps in when we are monitoring for this. And you'll notice there's pretty rapid change in the span of a single summer and then over the course of each year as well. And by the time we reach 2020, this entire patch that we've been monitoring is almost completely deforested. So I'm going to talk about some of the actual science research applications that have been done with our data using different types of machine learning processes. We'll start with the oceans through a project called the Allen Coral Atlas. And the Allen Coral Atlas project is working to create a dynamic global map at 3.7 meter resolution of coral reefs to monitor their health over time. I'm sure many of you know the coral reefs are being impacted by rising sea temperatures from climate change. They are extremely vulnerable. They are an, an, a very important part of our planet's ecosystem. And the fact that they are changing and they're changing rapidly means that you cannot have a static map. In order to completely understand what the processes are, are that are affecting coral growth and die off, we need to have these dynamic maps. And this is what the Allen Coral Atlas is trying to tackle. The way a coral atlas works is that it's looking for healthy coral, stressed coral, and bleached coral. And there are color differences in these that, even though these are underwater, you can actually spot with the satellite imagery because the water is so shallow in a lot of these areas. So healthy coral means you have coral and algae living and thriving together, so the coral will appear sort of a greenish hue. The stressed coral is uh, a state that causes the algae to leave the coral, and so it starts to look a little bit more brown. And then the bleached coral is when it is completely free of algae or nearly free of algae, and that is when the coral is in its most vulnerable state because it doesn't have the algae there as this protective outer layer. And this is, uh, appears in the images as a very light color. The Allen Coral Atlas has a web interface that you can go through and you can actually zoom in into different areas in sort of a Google Earth-esque fashion and turn on different layers to look at different mapped areas of coral reefs. You can look at different types of analysis, so benthic, which is the stuff that's on the bottom of the ocean at any area, 
uh, geomorphic analysis, bathymetry, uh, insights from the Coral Reef Watch, which is where people can submit alerts and keep track of coral reef health in their area if they live near a coral reef. And the way that they've approached this is, this is an example if you zoom in on some of the satellite imagery of one of the coral reefs, and you can turn on the map layers. And this is a fusion of satellite imagery with ground truth data collected via boats. So they've gone through with cameras that they hang out underwater, and then they figure out where the different types of coral and other geomorphic features in the coral reef structure are located. And then they look at what those areas appear like from the satellite images. Now, obviously, it's not feasible to take a boat to every single coral reef on the planet because they are quite extensive and some are extremely remote, so they're very hard to get to. So the way they're doing this is through convolutional, convolutional neural networks. So they can take the areas where they have mapped out on the ground what the coral reefs look like and then extrapolate that to the satellite imagery and then use that as a training data set to then take that and apply it across the planet so that you can try to get an idea of where the coral reefs are. Um, this relatively new paper, I guess brand new paper, just came out in 2020, um, headed by the, the Global Discovery and Conservation Science Center at Arizona State University, led by Greg Asnar, um, also looked at global coral reef probability maps using CNNs. And so they train on a planet scope base map, which is a, a one year mosaic of three meter global images, which consists of over 500,000 separate planet images in this case. And they used the Millennium Coral Reef Mapping Project data, knowing where coral reefs uh, should be, to do some manual feature classification um, or combined with manual feature classification of deep water clouds and land and going off of comparing their CNN results with the Millennium Coral Reef Mapping Project, they found that their models gave them a global accuracy of 87% in terms of predicting where these reefs are and local accuracy in specific areas up to 93%. So this method worked very well. This is just an example of the reef maps taken on the ground and with some of the lower resolution satellite imagery combined with the reef extent maps that were created from the machine learning algorithms, the CNN used in this, in this uh, process. So you can see the panels on each one comparing the results to each other and you have a much more fine scale idea of exactly where the reefs are and what the structure looks like from this methodology. You can also look at public health issues like air quality monitoring through satellite imagery. So fine particulate matter, smaller than 2.5 microns, poses a serious risk to human health around the world. And a lot of this particulate matter that is of that size comes from pollution. These are human sources. So again, PM 2.5 is particulate matter of a diameter of 2.5 microns or smaller. And measuring this from orbit has traditionally required the use of aerosol retrieval products that have resolutions of greater than one kilometer. So this means that trying to make these estimates on the ground are extremely coarse and they have very large uncertainties. Now you can also get this information from air quality monitoring stations on the ground, but they are very expensive to build and operate and maintain, and they are not evenly distributed around the planet. So a team out of Duke University sought to create a more accurate and cost-effective approach to mapping out ground-level particulate matter using a combination of satellite imagery and air quality monitoring stations, combined with the power of convolutional neural networks. This is something you'll see a lot. So they used a CNN to identify features on the ground in planet imagery, things like building and roads, near 35 different air quality monitoring stations in Beijing. And they analyze color changes of these features over time related to the changing pollution levels, which they could get from the air quality monitoring stations. So the image that you see here, these are the images from planet. And then up in the upper left corner of each one is the particulate matter level or the pollution level that was measured from the air quality monitoring station that is contained within this image. They fed these results then into a random forest regressor to estimate the particulate matter levels using the CNN extracted features combined with weather conditions from weather, other, weather underground. So to make sure that the differences that they were looking at came from pollution rather than something like clouds or haze or fog. 
So this is just a diagram showing what they did. They have satellite imagery from planet covering these areas, and then they looked at other factors like temperature, relative humidity, wind speed, and sea level pressure, put those things into the CNN to get the features on the ground over time, then fed those into the random forest regressor, and then they can create this map at what they did at 200 meter resolution uh, of the estimated particulate matter levels on the ground. So this is an example of an image over Beijing uh, with the pretty poor air quality on the left and obviously very clear air quality on the right. So through this study, they found the error for Beijing came out to about 24% compared to just the levels on the ground. And then they retrained their random forest regressor on planet imagery and weather data for Shanghai without retraining the CNN in terms of the uh, color variations that you would expect to see with features on the ground to look at pollution levels over Shanghai. And the error for Shanghai came out to about 19%. So this isn't bad. So this suggests that this method could be easily applied to any similarly urbanized area that has kind of the same color schemes uh, even where you might not have enough air quality monitoring stations to get a good reading. So this will give us a much more widespread and high resolution way to look at ground level pollution on, uh, around the globe. Another big application area for using machine learning with satellite imagery is for agriculture. And this example is specifically from food security. And food security around the world is tightly linked to meteorologic, climatologic, and economic factors. COVID-19 in particular has severely impacted the global food system, requiring rapid response in affected countries to design and enact aid programs. In this case, the government of Togo approached NASA Harvest, which is NASA's food security arm run out of the University of Maryland, and this was work led by Dr. Hannah Kerner. Uh, they created a countrywide map of cropland as part of an effort to distribute aid to farmers to boost food production to combat the effects of COVID-19 on the farms in the area. Harvest tackled this amazingly and created a map and delivered it to the government in 10 days. What they did for this process was they hand labeled a training data set using planet imagery of Togo to mark cropland versus non cropland and this gave them a little over 1300 hand labeled examples. Um, those are the ones you can see in the figure on the right here. And then they combined those with a crowdsource labeled data set of 36,000 labels of cropland versus not cropland, but these were distributed all over the globe. They then used a one layer multi-headed LSTM model to predict whether a pixel contained cropland or not. And their accuracy was about, is about 0.81, the precision of 0.7. So the results for this came out pretty well. And this is what their crop probability map looked like. They used a combination of our SkySat base maps at our, the old 72 centimeter resolution, um, our planet scope imagery and base maps, and then they compared those to the lower resolution publicly available data at 30 meter and 100 meter. And you can see the crop probability maps are much better. You can get a much clearer idea of these smallholder farms in these areas to see where the crops are. Another big area of interest, of course, is the effects of climate change on the Arctic. And we have a couple examples here. In Arctic and boreal regions, millions of freshwater lakes influence carbon dioxide and methane emissions into the atmosphere. And so Sarah Cooley, who was at Brown University at the time and is now at OSU, was tracking subseasonal changes in Arctic lakes. And she did this using over 76,000 planoscope images covering about 100,000 individual lakes across Alaska and the Canadian Arctic to track near daily changes in water extent via machine learning. And this is significant because if these lakes are disappearing over time, it's exposing more areas where carbon dioxide and methane can be released into the atmosphere. And there's a huge reservoir of this trapped in the ground in the Arctic. Uh, these are some examples here on the right of her water extent maps. And this is uh, the study areas that she worked on, so you can see just how extensive these are um, in Alaska, the Yukon, Northwest Territories, and Manitoba, and the maps of all of the different lakes in this area. So she did this by selecting images and then creating an initial buffered mask to 
figure out where the water is and then classify water pixels versus non-water pixels and then create lake area time series so they could actually look at the area of these lakes changing through the course of days and weeks over the year. And you can see the plots here on the right how a lot of these lakes have changed area. This process revealed that uh, dynamism, which is a measure of the change in area of these lakes, revealed that in some areas, the lake shorelines fluctuated much more widely than previously known at a time scale unseen before planet imagery because these things are changing so quickly, you might not get these snapshots to look at how much they've changed within a single season, especially with weather conditions the way that they are in the Arctic, you get a lot of clouds. So getting imagery near daily gives you much more of an opportunity to try to peer through those clouds or catch breaks in the clouds. And this suggests that these lakes might be emitting more greenhouse gases than previously thought, which has a huge impact on our atmosphere and huge implications for climate change in terms of permafrost in the Arctic around the world. In high mountain Asia, climate change is accelerating melting of glaciers and increasing the risk of catastrophic glacial outflow floods. And these can cause serious economic uh, damage and obviously pose a lot of risks to human health and livestock, or human lives and livestock. Uh, this is a brand new paper by Kayum et al. 2020 out of uh, IST Islamabad and Metapol University in Istanbul. And they used plate imagery to look for glacial lakes via UNET models. And they found significantly more lakes using this process than previously known from lower resolution satellite data. This is an area that is extremely difficult to get to, so there wasn't really much of an opportunity to do a lot of ground-based surveys. And they were able to capture changes in the extent of these lakes and the number of these lakes over the course of just a couple of weeks. So the images here are from uh, July 14th of 2017 through August 7th of 2017. And it might be a little bit hard to see because there's so many small dots. But uh, if you take a look, you can actually see that there are changes in the number and extent of these dots over time. And the results that they got were pretty precise as well. So this is a model that you can take and perhaps apply to other glaciers around the world where you have melt ponds forming on top of them. We've also had a lot of applications in terms of forestry, uh, deforestation like we saw earlier, but also looking at carbon emission monitoring from deforestation. Uh, this is another project out of Greg Asner's lab at ASU, and it works to fuse airborne LIDAR with planet scope images to map out carbon stocks and emissions in Peru. Now to do this, uh, Greg's lab has flown tracks of uh, airborne LIDAR over about 5% of Peru to measure tree heights and uh, basically getting these cross-sectional views of forests. And then through this, combined with the planet scope imagery, they can create models of how much carbon is contained in any single area. And this is because there are a lot of factors like tree density and uh, tree height that can be used as proxies to look at how much contained, um, what we call above ground carbon uh, is contained in any area. And so um, extrapolating those to, again, looking at what does this stuff from the areas where you have LIDAR, look like when you see it in the satellite imagery. They then took the LIDAR track areas from Peru and then extrapolated it from the 5% that they had mapped to the rest of the country. And you can see here are some maps of the uh, ACD, above ground carbon density and the carbon emissions in uh, different areas of Peru. So we can see what intact forest looks like versus um, a meandering river, obviously no vegetation in the river. And then you can see areas where human activity has impacted the area as well. And this area is particularly prone to deforestation uh, as well as illegal gold mining. And that has had a lot of impact on uh, carbon emissions from deforestation as well. So the next step is to take this and expand it to all tropical forests. Again, you can't fly LIDAR tracks over every single forest in the tropics. And so using Peru as this training data set, you can then take that and apply it elsewhere. So you can see in Brazil, uh, there are very rapid areas uh, here outlined in white. So if we flip between the images again, you can see areas of new deforestation between images on a week to week basis. So again, tracking this stuff on a short time scale can help track this down, especially if you're trying to look at places for illegal logging. But then from that, you can create maps 
this is a goal to create these maps uh, where you can actually quantify carbon emission loss based on areas where you have observed deforestation over time and figure out how this is impacting our atmosphere. So I challenge you as the audience with your machine learning skills, what would you do if you could see daily change of anything on our planet and take advantage of this huge time stack of data to uh, feed into any machine learning algorithms that you have worked on or you might have ideas for? And if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Um, we can also chat in the Q&A as soon as this talk is over. Uh, and with that, I'll take any of your questions. All right. Sure. Well, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Dave Costanero. I'm the Technical Director of Prepare AI. Uh, that was a really cool session by Dr. Tanya Harrison of Planet. So I'm here with her now, uh, and we're alive for some Q&A. So uh, Tanya, I've got a bunch of questions that folks put into the chat, so we can kind of go through those. And if, any, if you want to uh, tangent on anything that, that might be interesting, we can do that. And then uh, I will keep monitoring, and Alexis, our Zoom captain, will keep monitoring the, the chat. Alexis, jump in any time if, if there's anything that makes, makes sense uh, to, to jump in on. Uh, so Tanya, first question. There's a question in the chat from, from Charlie, and he asks, Storing 15 terabytes of data per day has to get unrealistic at some point. What are your policies for storing this massive amount of data? That's a great question. It's a ton of data to deal with and we don't have our own servers to store that because it would just get pretty unwieldy for a company the size of Planet, which you know we're less than 500 people right now. So we store everything on the cloud. Um, and that actually makes it really convenient because that way, if we have folks that want to get a huge amount of data from us, it's easy for us to take it and dump it from our cloud bucket into their cloud bucket, rather than having to sit there and you know do like an FTP download or um, the traditional way that some of the companies have done this before is to actually mail you a hard drive if you needed a huge amount of data. Uh, so this is a really efficient way for us to get the data from our satellites through our ground stations and then out into the cloud where it sits and waits for people to use it. So you may not know all the technical details of it, but I'm sure you can maybe compress things or archive. Is there anything that you just throw away? Like do you do a change detection, look at the diff and say, hey, this, these 1,700 square miles have not changed since yesterday. So uh, just delete those files and refer to yesterday's file. Is there anything like that going on? No, we actually save everything. I, I, there's some government regulation that requires that we save every single image that we take. So um, anything that we get and comes to the ground, it stays there, uh, I guess, in perpetuity until the government says otherwise. <laughs> wow, that's fascinating. Yeah. So I'm actually yeah. curious, what cloud provider are you using for this? Are you using AWS, Azure, Google, something else? Uh, oh gosh, I, we switched at some point and I always confuse which one we're with now versus where we were, but I think we're right now we're on AWS. Gotcha. Cool. Thanks. Cool. And we don't uh, endorse or, or otherwise <laughs> either. No, 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 no. <laughs> Just curious. <laughs> they're, they're all great. Um, let's see. Uh, next question. How long do the satellites last uh, and how much fuel do they have? You mentioned that you're doing the altitude changing maneuvers. Uh, you know, how, how how much throw do you have there? Can you move up or down five feet and then it runs out of gas and the booster, is it, is it like a little air puff that, that moves it? How, how long does that last? So it depends on which satellites you're talking about. The ones that we moved were the SkySat satellites and they do have little thrusters on board that we used to move them. Um, that was based on almost just a suggestion that someone kind of threw out in a meeting at one day where they said, well, it would be great if we could have higher resolution imagery, what should we do? And someone just offhandedly said, oh, why don't we lower the orbit altitude of the satellites? And then the team actually sat down, did the calculations, realized, oh, we, we can do that. We can, we can make that happen. And between the time that that got shot out at a meeting and it actually happened was something like six or eight months. So it was a really, really fast timeline. Um, the, those satellites, the operational lifetime, I believe is about six years, six to eight years. Uh, the Dove satellites that we have on the other hand, the CubeSats, which is what Planet is really known for, they don't have any propulsion on board. And so they stay in orbit um, for maybe a year or two, depending on where they are. And they slowly deorbit over time and then burn up in the atmosphere. Uh, so we don't do any orbit adjustments on those in terms of like, thrusters to, to keep them where they are. Uh, 
we used um, some tricks of the solar panels basically to keep them uh, in their happy orbits until they deorbit. And that's intentionally done because we do improvements to the satellites over time. So like the first generation of doves that we launched basically have no component in common at this point with the most recent version of the doves that we've launched. And so we've gone through a few um, different iterations. We have Dove Classics, which are the oldest ones that we still have a few operating in orbit. Uh, then we have Dove Refresh, where we decided to switch out the sensor. So we went from using uh, a, a, a bare pattern filter, which is what is normally found like in your DSLR or even your cell phone, um, to using a butcher block filter so that we could get better spectral response with these Dove Refresh satellites. And now our newest generation are called Super Doves, which are right now you have, we have five band images. Later this year, we should have eight band images. Um, so just expanding what the Dove capability is. And so as the older satellites deorbit, we replace them with the newer versions each time. So the constellation just keeps getting technical improvements as we decide to make changes to the satellites over time. That's fascinating. Um, great. Okay, so another question here is, can you comment on the cost and competitive landscape of satellite imagery versus, you know, traditionally flying an airplane or even some now fly a drone? Um, I, I can't say too much specifically about pricing, but I can say in general, the satellite imagery is much cheaper. The nice thing about Planet in particular is that we're taking this daily imagery all the time. Like the satellites are essentially always on as long as we're over land. And so you don't have to do any scheduling or booking in advance to do that. Uh, same thing with something like Landsat from NASA or Sentinel from the European Space Agency to other big data providers. They're taking coverage all the time. Granted, it's at a much lower spatial resolution and a lower temporal resolution, but you have access to that data just sitting there. You can go and get it as, as quickly as you need it. Whereas if you're flying a drone, you need to actually go out there and fly it or an airplane, you have to find someone that can go and do that for you. The weather conditions might not be so great, and that can be bad if you're trying to do, say, um, disaster response after a hurricane. You want to get images as quickly as possible, and clouds can still pose a problem for satellite images, but it at least gives you another chance to take a look at something that's already there without necessarily um, having to go through the extra steps of figuring out how do we get assets out to take that imagery, if that makes sense. Great. Yeah, no, that makes a ton of sense. Um, appreciate that. So next question uh, from the audience, the attendees, how are you getting average tree height from satellite data? And so I, I might expand on that a little bit. I bet there's all kinds of interesting things that you like can or cannot get from satellite that you can or cannot get just from like looking at it on the ground or measuring on the ground. Maybe you can expand on that. Like, how do you measure the height of a tree? Do you get like better or worse, like electromagnetic spectrum, things that you can detect, um, like material, color? What kinds of things can you detect and can you not detect from satellites? That's a good question. Uh, in terms of this particular example, the tree height was actually from LIDAR data. So when they were flying the tracks with the airplane that I mentioned, that's what they're using to actually get the, the tree height information. And then uh, in terms of other things that you can see, um, Basically anything that you can distinguish with your eye, you can have a computer distinguish for you in a satellite image. So it, you just need enough training data to get your algorithms to be able to say, you know, this is concrete or this is bare ground or this is grass or this is uh, corn or soybeans or whatever you want to actually figure out what you're looking at in your satellite image. Um, you can also do, so that's just based on like either appearance in one or more bands. You can also do fancy band math in a lot of cases. So we have things like uh, NDVI, which is a vegetation index that tells you how healthy or not healthy plants are. Um, we have a similar one that's NDWI, which is a water index that tells you what is water and what is not, which might seem very obvious from looking at a satellite image. Water looks very distinct, but it's kind of nice to be able to do a quick, a little bit of band math and, and see like in a flood for example what areas have flooded compared to maybe an image that you had before where the the place wasn't flooded um I'm trying to think of some other examples you can get some topographic information in terms of heights trees are a little bit below the resolution limit like individual trees when you're talking about planoscope imagery um, but you can do stereo so you can make digital elevation models or digital terrain models 
uh, with this recurring data. You can also do it with the SkySat imagery. We can do triplicate stereo. Um, the SkySats can also do full motion video, which is a little trippy to look at from orbit because you can actually see how the satellite is moving over your target on the ground. And I love that just from like a space nerd standout point. Like I'm watching a satellite as it's taking a video from orbit and I can see how the satellite itself is moving. Um, and you can catch things like cars driving on highways. You can see ocean waves as they're lapping up on shore. We can see planes taking out off from airports. And the fact that you can see all this from space just blows my mind, even though I look at this stuff every day. That is really neat. Is it, um, so it's often, I mean, that, that's interesting, like mostly just the visual spectrum. And so you're not really like taking in UV or, or uh, infrared. You're just looking at what a camera can take. We, we personally do our red, green, blue, and near infrared. We're expanding that a little bit with these SuperDove satellites so that we add a few more bands, but they're still visible to near infrared just because once you start getting out into thermal wavelengths, you have to build satellites with coolers and they get really big and really expensive really quickly. Okay. And so since most of our satellites are about this big, <laughs> right. we, we can't fit cryo coolers on them. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but there are other satellites that do that, like Landsat and, and um, Sentinel go farther out into the thermal. Okay. And so... Uh, you know, I know it's just when I'm looking at something from straight above uh, that it's it's usually hard. To, it looked like you were angling back or forward to to get like a little bit of an angle at something. Is that is that correct? Or do yeah, you straight down? It depends. The satellites are pretty close to nadir, so pretty close to straight down. But the doves tend to vary a little bit, so they'll, they'll float from like five degrees, um, kind of in either direction. The sky stats we can actually point since they do have propulsion on board. So those, I'm not sure what the maximum off nadir angle is, but we've taken some pretty extreme uh, off nadir images where you can see things like the skyline of Dubai, which so you can actually see the height of the buildings. Or um, there was one point when we actually turned one of the satellites back to take an image of a launch of some of our other satellites at some huge angle. So the image looks really distorted, but the fact that you can see this Soyuz rocket launching from another satellite is really cool. That's awesome. Okay, here's another question we got. Uh, so we got a few minutes left. So yeah, folks, if you've got questions, please keep them coming in on the chat. These are good ones. Um, so someone is asking, uh, in relation to this segment on deforestation, did you use a known model uh, to predict the CO2 level or is the model learned from ground measurements of CO2 parts per million, that sort of stuff? That I'm not sure since that's work out of Greg Asner's lab, so I don't remember what model they use specifically to calculate that. I'm sorry. Okay, no problem. Um, so here's another one. It seems like labeling the data sets is always a barrier to building these models. Using Peruvian forests to extrapolate features of forests worldwide was a great idea. Does Planet rely on the organization using the data to label imagery for their use, use case correctly, or do you assist in the training of the model as well in the labeling? Uh, it sounds like the latter, as you all have a lot of expertise. It depends on how closely we work with any particular group. So groups like uh, the Asner Lab, they're very tied in with us over, over the last few years. And so we work with them on a lot of different projects. We've had uh, planeteers like our director of academic programs, Dr. Joe Mascaro. He's been a co-author on multiple papers with them in terms of helping them out with this stuff. Um, we also do some collaboration with our NASA research customers. So we have a, an agreement with NASA actually that provides free access to our data to all NASA funded researchers. So if anybody is watching this and you do research with NASA, you can use our data. Uh, let me know, I can get you hooked up. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's, a, it's the kind of thing where like, if you want to work with us, it, it, you can reach out and we're totally willing to help you figure this stuff out. Great. Uh, so a question I was having is, uh, do you sync up with GPS satellites or other third party data or outside your system? It, like, it seems like there's becoming this global space-based compute ecosystem. So do you use GPS data from those US military satellites or do you like create your own baseline of where things are? Uh, or you know, does that make any sense? Yeah, it's pretty much internal to the satellites, but we do use other data sources for different pieces. Like um, we, we use some stuff from Landsat and MODIS uh, satellites to do calibration of our own data. Um, 
We also do a lot of, right now our big project is data fusion. So working to actually create better image products by fusing data from different sources to um, you know, fill in gaps, uh, increase resolution, both spatially and temporally, uh, stuff like that. Excellent. Uh, let's see. One of the other questions here is, do we have an idea of the seasonal volume change of high altitude lakes or just the surface area of the water? From the satellite imagery, just the surface area. Theoretically, you could go through and get 3D information if you had something like star data, or radar data, to look at the depths of the lakes and see how that's changing over time. But from, from our data alone, you could only get the surface area change. Great. Okay, so then here's this, there's another kind of cheeky uh, question in the, in the Q&A. Uh, will ML satellite imagery finally be able to tell us how long the coastline of Britain is? <laughs> There's a paradox. Are you familiar with the paradox of the British coastline? No, I tell this story. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'm guessing it's that when you keep zooming in, like it looks like it's it's like the symmetry. Uh, I'm probably getting this way off, but like if you look at a coastline from any zoom level, it still looks like a coastline. So maybe they're just like fractals. Like they're saying, like there's an infinite length of geometry. I'm not sure. Huh. So, I'm really curious now. I'm gonna have to look this up. <laughs> the question was this. Shout out to whoever asked that. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then I think the last question that we've got here is, so machine learning and your tools, use it, you're using them to map the Earth's surface, making relationships between contiguous data points. Um, oh, okay. So Charlie, Charlie is saying, yes, infinitely fractal. That is the paradox, the coastline. Oh, okay. Um, and so... I guess this one, this last question is kind of just how, maybe expand on some of the like the interesting use cases, like how, how are people using, or how can people use the data in new and exciting ways that, that maybe they haven't yet? Like, are there things that are on your mind? Like, hey, we don't have a customer or a client or a use case doing X yet. What are those things? I would like to see the data being used outside of fields where you traditionally would expect it. Like a lot of the examples I gave here are very earth science heavy. That's a bias because I'm a geologist by training. So this is the stuff I understand the best, but there are applications in, in like terms of human geography. So stuff like public health, we've had a few people work on things like um, monitoring color of standing water bodies in LA, like swimming pools to see how well they're maintained because those can become breeding grounds for mosquito-borne illnesses like West Nile virus, which is becoming more of a problem in Southern California. Um, similarly, there's folks doing studies like that on standing bodies of water in Africa where you have other mosquito-borne illnesses that are a problem. But that's still very earth science focused. Like the color of the water is telling you something very specific about the conditions in that water body. I think that there are ways that you could fuse this data with other external data sets, kind of like the folks did in the Beijing model where they combined the satellite imagery with the air quality monitoring data to get that extra level of something out of it. it you can actually use the satellite imagery to tell you what the ground pollution level is. So if we can start combining satellite imagery with other data sources from things like public health, what else is buried in there that you might be able to learn to help human lives here on the ground? That's an excellent, excellent place to, to stop. I, I, very exciting. I agree. Well, well, thanks so much, Tanya. We appreciate your, your time and your expertise here at Prepare.ai. Uh, appreciate it. Great. Thanks, everybody who dialed in. Thanks, everyone.